Hello and welcome to the podcast. Glad you're here to join myself and actually a new co-host today that I'm going to be introducing in a moment. But on today's podcast, we are going to be talking about ways to empower yourself for 2021 at the deepest level. And to do that, we're going to use my first book, I Am, as a guidebook to take us through the year as I go through certain chapters over the course of the year on certain podcasts. And to do this, I'm bringing on a new co-host to help me out. Um, I'm bringing on a, a friend of mine who's been on a previous podcast before. Her name is Tierney Ray, and she is a yoga instructor, and she also runs a book club studying self-awareness, spirituality, and consciousness. And she is also a seeker of life's deepest answers and ways to be empowered. So Tierney Ray, thank you for joining me and helping me out in going through the book and, and on today's podcast and really a lot of the podcasts that I'm going to be doing this year. I appreciate you doing that. Absolutely. I'm super excited that you asked me to do this with you and I always enjoy our conversations. So it's absolutely. just like food for my soul. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. So no, absolutely. I think, you know, a lot of times I do monologue and, and I have talks on my podcast where I just talk about certain topics, but I think it's great to have another voice that can interact mm -hmm. and ask questions and um, really just dig deeper into the material and, and be a bridge for the audience. So I think it'll be great to have your voice added to the material and your questions. So again, I really appreciate it. Mm -hmm. um, absolutely. So for today's episode on The Guru, we are going to talk about uh, the first part of my first book, I Am, uh, which is a deep dive into self-awareness. And we're going to sort of take apart the first, uh, the introduction and, and the first couple chapters um, and give you a little bit of insight to help you. It's actually, this is kind of cool, Terry. This is kind of like a live book club for this episode, you know, where people can, can kind of listen along and, and really get all the cliff notes and the deep nuggets, dare I say, without reading the book, but you better read the book. <laughs> <laughs> and we can um, talk with the author, which is the best thing, because yeah. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> yeah. it just allows us to dive so much deeper into everything. I mean, I have so many questions. <laughs> well, well, that's exactly why I've got you co-hosting. So this is, this is perfect. So just to start out, I want to read just the the beginning, um, which I may have read before in a podcast, but I'm going to read it again. Um, mm. In the very introduction, it says, answers are not found. They are allowed. The journey of self-awareness and self-creation is the very intent of life. The capability to understand your true nature, expand your consciousness, and know thyself is a birthright. You will not be denied in your search. If you feel denied, it is because in some way you have denied yourself, thereby stretching your experience of time. You can always choose to avoid what shows up and interpret the world the same way you did yesterday, or you can decide to open to new possibilities that offer you a new reality for today. Either way, life will continue to bring you an endless stream of information to support you on your quest. This moment and this book, and actually I'll ad lib, this podcast is one of them. So that's how the book opens up. And when I wrote it, I felt like that's what was coming through me to the reader to let them know that, hey, this has made your way into your awareness for a reason. So if you're hearing this and listening to this, there are no coincidences. This information showing up, you can take as much or as little as you want into your life. But the purpose of all of it and what I discovered in, in my experience is to help empower you to a greater sense of peace of mind and a greater sense of the internal creative power of creation so that you know that by the way you think, the way you feel and the way you act, that you have so much influence on the way that your life unfolds from this moment forward. And I thought, what a great gift to be graced with personally. And I felt so humbled by it that I felt incredibly honored to be able to share that. So that's how the book opens. That's really the invitation in the introduction. And then I um, 
then I go into my story a little bit bit. Mm. And so when um, you say in the beginning that it's not something that you seek, but something that you allow, and I hope I'm saying it right. Cause I don't have a yeah. book in front of me. <laughs> Dive a little bit deeper into what you mean by that, because I mean, I guess it can be applied in so many different ways and interpreted in so many different ways, but do you remember what was going through your mind when you wrote those words or did it just kind of flow through you? No, I remember exactly what, what the meaning was behind that. And basically what it means is that you don't find an answer. You are allowing an answer to enter your space by the nature of your desire and readiness to receive the answer. So you don't just find something. You have to be ready for what that piece of awareness means to your life. So it's really a deeper layer of contemplation on the idea that you prepare yourself to receive insight. And there's nothing you, you won't allow in that you're not ready for in some way. Because awareness is going to change a fundamental component of who you are. It's going to expand your identity, which is change. And so that's why I say that they're allowed, they're not found. Because answers that are found without being allowed aren't embraced. Let me say that one more time. Answers that are say found. That again. <laughs> yeah, mm-hmm. Answers that are found without being allowed on the deepest part of you are not embraced. It goes in one ear and out the other. Mm. Because to embrace it means you have to actually change who you are and the way that you act and the way that you be in the world with that new piece of insight. So, um, you know, a lot of people I've heard, they, they bought the book and they read the first section and then they put it down. They didn't touch it again for six months. Then they came back to it six months later and they read the whole thing. But the first time it's almost like what they opened was more than they were ready to experience. Mm -hmm. And so they had to take it in. They had to only absorb what they could for that moment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Which brings up something else, Tierney, is that if you look around the world and what we have access to at our fingertips through Google or through the internet, I mean, we can access virtually the world's library of insight and awareness. We could sit there 24 seven reading all day long. So, but you have to be ready. You have to be, you have to be ready to experience it. And I think that was, you know, a lot of people ask me, you know, what was that key moment for you when all this insight fell upon you and, and the, or how did it happen? And, and it's a combination, as I've said many times, of just really, truly wanting answers, being unafraid to grab those answers, to embrace them, um, no matter how they were going to change me or dissolve my old self. And that's another thing I learned that you don't have to get rid of your old self. You can bring it along. It's just, but you are going to change the nature of how you are as a human being. Um, mm-hmm. But you have to be, you have to be ready and you have to be, you have to be willing to do the work of contemplation. And a lot of my beliefs immediately fought for their lives. Like the one big one was regret, mm-hmm. right? I had so many regrets. Oh, I should have done this and I should have done that, and et cetera, et cetera. And I kept contemplating this one idea, this one notion, which is I spend a lot of time in the book on this um, about regret and just how it's, it's a lie. Woulda, coulda, and shoulda are lies, right? But my brain did not want to let go of that because I had lived in that space for so long and carried that burden for so long that I didn't know who I was going to be without regret. What would that mean? Well, I found out what that meant. And it was very blissful um, because it was a, re- a release of so much energy. I was carrying so much negative energy that was a lie. Not that I, I would want to so, you know, I mean, go ahead. I have a question because a lot yeah. of people, I know we all have regret in some way. And is it always a negative thing? Cause sometimes we hold this regret and it could be from a lot of reflection. So how is it, how can it be beneficial and then how does it not serve us? So I I don't think regret is beneficial at all. I don't think it has one shred of ever. 
Mm. I think awareness has benefit. Mm. Understanding has benefit. But the quicker you can free yourself of any negative idea of who you are because of a past quote mistake that you think you made or something you said to somebody, the better you'll be positioned to create a different experience. And here is why regret says I should have, would have, or could have done something different. I am imperfect in some way. I am shameful. I am embarrassed. I am guilt ridden. Those I am statements as we'll learn throughout the, the course of these podcasts from time to time, those I am statements work into our lives to become reality again, because our ego has to validate that truth. So it's going to, it's almost like you're setting up your future to experience guilt, shame, and regret again, because you haven't let mm. go of any past regret. Mm. Now, let me be clear. And I've said this many times, this is not condoning anything you did. This is not lacking understanding for someone who was hurt. It's actually understanding their hurt so much that you're, that you're willing to change who you are going forward. Because what most people would say when someone's done some wrong to them, you know, apologies don't really do any good. Don't like my mom used to tell me when I was a kid, I'm when I'd say, I'm sorry, mom, sorry, whatever, you know, for what I said or did whatever, you know, she used to say to me, Howie, don't tell me, show me. Mm. Well, how do you show somebody if you're still filled with guilt, shame, and regret, if you see yourself as negative, you're sort of destining yourself to another negative experience. So you have to forgive your own self. And the only way to do that is by letting go of regret. Mm. Keeping the experience, not condoning it, being aware, but being aware of who you want to be going forward. And the power to do that comes most out of a soul that is, is, um, at peace with themselves in this moment. Mm -hmm. Make sense? Yeah. And it's really about letting that regret reveal to you what you do want to call in or how you do want to start experiencing life, whether it be, I mean, in any area of your life. So it's like allowing that regret to show you what's possible. Wow. And then stepping into that possibility. That's a really interesting point. I think you just nailed what the purpose of regret is for that instant. It's contrast. Mm -hmm. I feel like shit uh, from this suffering that I'm having for what I just did. I don't want to feel that. I don't want to be this. Therefore, I don't want to do that again. So right. that's the moment of transformation. I'm going to, I'm going to be a different person. Now I think what greases the wheel on that is to let go of that regret. Cause if you carry it, it's going to be harder to be that version. Cause you're still going to feel mm -hmm not good enough. And again, what right. the universe is not constantly allowing trying, you, right. Not yeah, allowing you to step into the possibility, which is what you talk about so much in the book is about these infinite possibilities that are always available to us. And it's almost like we block ourselves from being aware of them. <laughs> that's exactly and, right. Yeah. And it's so, I mean, it goes so deep in all areas of our life. Yeah. Well, it's not only that we block the possibility, but we don't believe ourselves worthy of that possibility. We don't believe ourselves worthy of that particular man or woman. We don't believe ourselves worthy of that job or that education. We don't believe ourselves worthy of that level of performance in our art or in our sports performance. You know, so it, 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 it filters into any single area as a limitation because our consciousness, we haven't been properly taught how to think from that expansive, unconditionally loving place. We know it when we're children, but then as we become adults and our ego starts to form, we have, first of all, we have parental nurturing and our parents are doing the best they can, but they're obviously limited from their parents in what they understood. And so that gets passed along. And then our genetics start to take over as we start to get older. And as, and, and this goes throughout our entire life as you know, as, like I've said before, there's many times where you said, 
can't believe how much you're becoming like your mother or your father. It's because our genetics, as we get older, it tries, they try to express themselves. So mm. to be conscious of this work, I think is transformational, not only on an individual level, but to me, this is the next evolution in human consciousness mm -hmm. is this understanding of how powerful our minds are. And so I think the way that this is going to be done is to be taught, you know, and I, my mission, as I've spoken about before, is to, to get this taught in high school before graduation, mm -hmm. you know, that people understand. So, so yeah, it's, it's a, it, it plays a long, it, it can, it can play a, a role in our lives for not only for lifetimes, really. Mm -hmm. That's how that's precious. That's really this is. neat about. Yeah, it's really neat because your book is something that I always go back to and listen to, and every time I listen to it, I interpret it and can apply it in my life in a different way because it's so mm. universal. Mm -hmm. And that's the cool thing. It's like these concepts and these ideas that you're explaining to people it's like not only can it apply to someone in their career it can apply in their relationship it can apply in just the world right now and everything that we're going mm -hmm. on with as a society and that's what's so neat is that you can always just revisit it and gain something new from it and how you're being able to apply it and embody exactly. it well i i appreciate that and and I, that's exactly right. Because at the end of the day, the the greater you see the potential for yourself inside, it's going to filter into every area of your life. It's, it's it, it is fascinating to watch people and how some people can thrive in one area of their life, like they can be a great business person, but then their relationships mm -hmm. can be a mess, or they can be mm -hmm. great with relationships, but their business constantly fails, or they don't do well mm -hmm. financially. So there's reasons for this. It's like we, we, maybe we're okay expanding our belief in one area of our life, but we limit it yeah. in another. And so I think the universality of the, of the work in the book is that it helps open doors on every area so that you find joy, mm -hmm. happiness, and fulfillment in every area, if that's what you're looking for. But I don't mm -hmm. think there's nobody who's coming to this work that is not looking for either relief, relief of suffering or a way to find themselves more empowered in what they're trying to achieve and do in the world. Mm -hmm. You just won't, you won't read it or you'll put the, you know, so I've actually had people, it's interesting to some of the reactions to this work if you're not ready for it. So, mm -hmm. but you're right. Yeah. You're completely right. It's something we all universally have in common is that desire to be free from our suffering and, have that sense of empowerment, but it's ultimately coming down to our mind. And um, that's why meditation has become so powerful, but it's really took a long time for me to like benefit from it mm -hmm. because at first you just don't understand like, why, why am I sitting in silence? <laughs> yeah. Your brain <laughs> wants like, to go, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh -huh. But ultimately it's like, you're in that silence kind of discovering that everything around you is at its core neutral and that we're attaching the meaning to everything around us. And so it's like, I'm doing these meditation practices right now, which are completely in alignment with everything your book talks about. Um, and it's just simple practices of like looking at an object and realizing that that object has no meaning. And like the, the practices are so simple that you're like, okay, what, like you can really go deep with it or you can just be quick and be done with it. But the, the more you start to apply it in your life, it's like, whoa, like everything is really neutral. It's content, but then our beliefs are what we're putting context into exactly. the content. You talk about yep. this in your book so much, which was so powerful. So I want to talk about that more. <laughs> I'm sure you yeah, have something no, to say actually, about that. No, absolutely. Well, I, I want, there's a couple of things I want to say. First of all, that, that's in actually chapter three, which we'll, we'll probably hopefully get to um, in today's podcast. But um, mm -hmm. meditate, the reason meditation has become so popular is because as the world has gotten busier, we've gotten more tired, exhausted. We feel more stressed. We feel more anxiety. And this, mm -hmm. this 
quote rat race, trying to keep up with everything and all the data and all the input. It's like this break of meditation just gives us that moment to just shut everything down and just go into silence and trust that we can do that for an hour or 15 minutes or a half hour and we're going to be okay. I think that's why yoga has exploded because it gives people mm-hmm. a pointed practice to go through not only for their body health and their flexibility, but for their minds mm-hmm. to just take a break. And so, and then the second part is in meditation, it's, it's weird. Your brain doesn't know what to do at first with just silence. It's like looking around going, okay, is this all there is? Uh, what do we do now? You know, it wants to do, do, do. And the whole point of meditation is to learn how to be. But the more you get into meditation, this was very, this was so cool when I started to meditate, is it, you, you enter that space quicker and quicker and quicker where you can drop the world and go into this sort of this cocoon of mm. stillness. And all of a sudden, you sit with it long enough, like uh, one time uh, years ago, I think a teacher said, it's like clouds passing by thoughts are like clouds and they slowly start to dissipate until there's no clouds and there's no thought. And that's when your energy just kicks up internally. Like you're, it, you're actually in a very hyper aware state in meditation. People mm-hmm. think, Oh, you go to sleep in meditation. Well, they're not, they're not doing it properly. You're actually yeah. in a very aware state. Mm-hmm. So it's like you're, you're in the world, but not of it to s- steal a very famous line from, the Bible. Um, But you're, you're, you're truly in the world and not of it, because all of a sudden, all you feel is you can feel just energy, or you can just feel the sense of stillness. And you're you you feel a sense of expanding possibilities. Because the limitating thoughts aren't there anymore. And when those fade away, of past and future, and you're just in the present, you start to feel more of the expansiveness and the unlimited possibilities that are in the moment. And it takes you to this higher state and higher state and higher state. When you come out of it, you feel refreshed, renewed, re-energized, and almost like a computer where you reset the computer, you feel a little bit of a reset. Mm -hmm. And you go into your day with a little more awareness, a little more balance, freshness, openness of heart, to me, that's the power of meditation. Um, and, and it's an entry to self-awareness mm-hmm. because the more you can be in that state, the more you can reflect without, um, without protection. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Yeah, you're so right. And I think too, like you said, yeah, people have this idea that when you meditate, you think you're just going to like sit there in the bliss and it's awesome. And the reality is you sit and you realize like how restless, not just your mind is, but your body. And I think really what, how I start to see it is that it's like an overstimulated nervous system. And so I think of when I sit down, I'm letting my nervous system just kind of come back into just Mm -hmm. being like a clear, calm lake. And it's like the moment we go back into the real world, these waves of thought start happening. But having that practice allows us to return to that state more often and then just start to observe the thoughts that we're having and why they're causing suffering within exactly. us. Exactly. Yep. That's what it leads to. And, and you're, ne- yeah, sorry, go ahead. No, you go ahead. <laughs> no, I was just going to say that your analogy of the lake is really good. Like when you're in an emotional mm-hmm. state or when you're thinking of past or future, you, you, it's like a lake that you've stirred up the bottom and all this soot and dirt is in the water and you can't see clearly. You can't see anything. And so you're kind of in this frantic mm-hmm. state, but as you sit, it's like everything settles. And you've seen pictures, you know, like of Lake Tahoe, how clear the water is in Lake Tahoe. You can see forever when the lake is still mm-hmm. and the bottom is still. And that's really the idea of meditation is to get your mind to that place where you can see all the possibilities. And when you can see more of the truth of the possibilities in in this lifetime and that anything can happen in any moment, then you're jazzed because it's like all those limitations are what is causing the suffering, either limitations on a personal basis or limitations on what's possible in the world. 
and and all mm-hmm. suffering can really be drawn back to that. So it's it's huge that um, uh, that more people are learning how to meditate and hopefully use it properly in order to um, achieve higher levels of consciousness and and higher levels of awareness because mm-hmm. it's a key to a life of empowerment. And, and this goes for any, you know, for anything you're trying to accomplish. Um, you know, even working with athletes at the highest level, um, it's constant work to have the mind be focused on what you're doing presently. Right. Because it's so Empty easy. Yeah. So easy for them to, to think about what could happen or what might happen or what did just did happen. And mm-hmm. the purest talent and expression comes out of the moment so um and everything you're saying right now is reminding me because and i had told you this i just watched the movie peaceful warrior the peaceful which, warrior yeah. Dan Millman. i highly recommend because that's exactly what you know the whole movie is about is emptying out your mind and just allowing yourself to be present in whatever it is you're doing and so mm-hmm. for me this year i've really like i didn't make too many big goals for myself. Like I had just really small intentions for myself of like slowing down and just trying to be super present in whatever I'm doing, whether it be like washing the dishes or cleaning my room. And like, that's what this year is about for me is just like slowing down and being fully present in everything that I'm doing. And sometimes that's the hardest thing. (laughs) It's like, you realize like how we just want to jump to the next thing so easily. And it's, it's, it's a challenge. But I will offer you this. When you finally yes. let go fully, mm-hmm. there's nothing you'll want to do but wash dishes or clean your room or have a, I don't mean that specifically, but just have a single pointed focus. I remember once I read something uh, about a monk in a monastery who was, you know, washing floors by hand or with a small brush. And all he did was beg for another floor to wash because that created the stillness that activity was just this meditative property that put him into this bliss because it was a one mm-hmm. single pointed focus. And I believe that's why a lot of cyclists cycle or, or marathoners run a uh, hikers hike, you know, it, it's just even golf, you know, is, is the same thing. It's an escape for four hours where your mind is focused on one single thing. Um, but um but yeah, so these these simple tasks, absorbing yourself into that moment can be a real break from your mind. And again, in today's world, um, that's why the shutdown has been interesting because it's caused everybody to, to really have to slow down and there's nowhere to go. There's not much to do. You're just kind of forced into being still with your own thoughts and your own space, you know, rather than all the distractions, which I think is very interesting. Um, given how fast paced this world had gotten. So um, anyway, um, so That's as we get a good topic though to bring up, because like, what's your advice for people right now? Because it's such a struggle for so many people that have never experienced that like stillness in their life. So many people have been just like on the go, one thing to the next, busy, busy, busy. So for anyone listening that's like, doesn't know what to do with themselves in this stillness, what is your piece of advice for them? So I think everything in everybody's life, specifically for them, happens for a particular reason on their journey of awareness. And I think when you combine that with the understanding of the only constant in the universe, which is change, that Mm -hmm. the quicker you can embrace the change, and mine out what is in it, what gift has been given to you by life, divinity, the universe, what it's giving you and offering you in this moment that you can learn for yourself, for your journey, or how that's going to help many people going forward because that you went through something like this, I think is important. So for many people who've been, who've known nothing but running around, maybe it's life trying to tell them, hey, take a moment and be still. And reflect upon your thoughts for a little bit and dig in a little bit. And again, if they're listening to this, which they wouldn't be, there's no coincidence that this is coming in. Maybe this is one of the reasons for that shutdown. You know, maybe they found their way to this particular podcast and this information. But 
I think it's life just maybe for those people saying, hey, take a look at what's being offered to you and see if you can challenge yourself to embrace that stillness. And maybe, just maybe, you'll realize that survival is not based on being busy and running around all the time, that there are more empowering ways for your survival. And maybe by going into self-awareness and understanding more about yourself, you could do 10 times the work and achieve 10 times the amount that you would by trying to run around without doing the inner work and finding yourself in the same exact situation over and over and over again. Maybe this is your opportunity for transformation. So that that's what's coming up for me on that question. Mm-hmm. Wow. That's perfect. Perfect response. Cool. Um, so chapter one is you are energy and matter. And the quote is your existence as matter is the self-evident truth that you matter. Hmm. I think I that quote's that. Yeah, I think that quote's really important to open up with because one of the fundamental roots of suffering is the feeling that I don't matter. And I can tell you that if you're hearing these words and you're alive and you exist in existence on, on this in this earth, that you matter. You were birthed into existence by the universe mm-hmm. for a specific reason. You've had a tremendous impact already. And maybe this moment is the the invitation to find out what that, you know, not a matter of if you've had impact, but what will that impact be? How will you choose to matter from this moment forward? So that's the invitation in, in chapter one um, to see that you matter. And then I kind of break it down a little bit um, and talk about how everything that, that can be seen or perceived by the senses um, is matter and that it takes force to occupy that space. Therefore, everything else in existence has a specific intent to it. Um, And the way that you know it has an intent, I use a really simple example in the book, is you say, well, what's the intent of a rock, (laughs) right? Well, the rock was once connected to the planet. So what was the intent of the planet? Well, the intent of the planet was to create life, to have a place for life to exist. Otherwise, the planet would be or we wouldn't be here. But what's the intent of the rock? Well, the intent of the rock is just to be it as it is. It's, an, it's inorganic matter, so it doesn't have uh, much complexity to it. But it does have a will. And it's nothing like a, a human conscious will, like we have in our thoughts and our ideas and our actions. But it has a will just by the nature of its existence. And, and the way that I say, if, if you don't think a rock has a will, try and pick one up and try and break it in half with your hands. You can't do it because there's a certain force of energy that it's holding it together, right? So there's something within it that is causing it to be. And I think it's a powerful connection of spirituality and science, mm-hmm. right? Science wants to break it down to its mineral, mineral uh, its molecules, atoms, et cetera. But there's still a force of energy within it that's creating it to be, which I think is really cool. And, and that goes for everything else in existence. Mm-hmm. And, the, and the reason that I brought that up, Tierney, was to, to kind of bring it back to the individual. So there's a will within each one of us to be. And the invitation is in chapter one, or in, in going through chapters one, two, and three about energy and matter is this idea that you have... You have a will to be or you wouldn't be here. You, some people call that a soul. The question is, what are you going to do? What, how are you going to express your soul? How are you going to express yourself? We know how the plant and the rock and the animal expresses itself. But as human beings, the beauty of our consciousness is that we have the authority in any moment to decide, declare, and demonstrate who we're going to be. Mm. Now, there is a little bit of a karmic tale behind us of who we've been, right? That people have memories of, which they're going to try and remind us of as we go forward. Mm -hmm. But the longer you go forward under the new identity, the, the, the shorter that tale gets. Till eventually they only remember the new you. Mm hmm. 
Who's Robert Downey Jr.? What's his famous character? Oh, God. I don't even know. <laughs> what? <laughs> I'm so bad with the name. No, I know, I know this actor, but what movie is he in? Well, I, I'm, I'm shocked that someone <laughs> oh, your <God>. age <laughs> doesn't know who Robert Downey Jr. So I was, I was trying to prove the point that it, it, normally most people in their early 20s would say, well, Robert Downey Jr.'s Iron Man, right? That's what he's played. That's like his famous character is Iron Man. I haven't even seen that movie. I'm so bad. Well, it's like five of them, and it's the Marvel movies oh, okay. um, with all the okay. the Marvel characters. <laughs> but anyway, Justice League, it's all about, um, it's a big allegory about life and um, um, good versus evil, et cetera. But anyways, um, most people, young people only know Robert Downey Jr. as Iron Man. My generation remembers when he was a lot younger and he was a troubled actor who was on drugs, who got arrested, who was kicked out of Hollywood, who couldn't get a job. And the, the reason I use that example, even though you don't know who Robert Downey did, what he played, is that um, to show just how nobody younger remembers any of that, they only know him as the highest paid actor in the world who played Iron Man. Like he's famous for that character. So I guess my point is you can you can turn over a new leaf and change who you are. And that's the gift that we have as human beings. And that's why I brought it up in chapter one, is that everything has a will and an intent, including you, and you have the authority to decide who you're going to be in any moment, which I think is so hopeful, right? It's a very hopeful notion to a lot of people. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, this is a huge point, and I think it's been huge for a lot of people who've been incarcerated, huge point of rehabilitation mm -hmm. is for someone to see that they're not chained to their past literally or figuratively like they, they can they can become somebody a different version of themselves at any moment um and i i think that's a that's a powerful reminder um and yeah. many and i, I many mean people. it ties back into the whole idea of how shame and our regrets can keep us in such a stagnant place because we're, we're just cycle, stuck yeah. in this identity of like, this is who I am and this is how people see me. And we don't even see the possibility of, of transformation. We don't believe it within our own right. selves. Exactly. Are we able to, you know, embody that, that way we desire to live or see ourselves. That's exactly right. We don't see it. We're not even going to step into trying to create it. And mm -hmm. if we don't believe it's a possibility for ourselves, again, that's why I'm going to keep hammering this home. That is why self-awareness is the doorway to everything you're trying to create for yourself in your life. The more you can go within and dig into the truth about who you are, the more expansive you'll see the possibilities in front of you. And the more energy and belief you'll put into action that creates the conditions that start to bring it your way. It's happened with every single thing I've ever done in my life and everybody else. And that goes for good and bad. Because yeah. you believe in something bad for yourself, you're going to find a way to uh, attract yourself to it. Sometimes this is called the law of attraction, but it's really the deeper notion of the law of attraction is really comes down to personal identity. Hence, hmm. I am <laughs> Poof, pretty, pretty profound. And when you, when you think about it, just how, you know, it's simple, but profound. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's, it just shows to how our, when we hold the same beliefs, even though the content, like you would say in our lives is different, we tend to repeat the same situations and scenarios over and over because it's the belief within ourselves that's not changing. And so that's what right. we keep you're in scene and recycling these same situations. And we're like, why does this keep happening to me? Why do I keep getting involved with these kind of people? It, it always goes back to ourselves. Right. Um, we talked about this before, but mind has to become matter. So you eventually have to validate what you believe is true in the world. You need the real world experience of the validation of what your truth is until you're so confident in that truth, there's no doubt anymore in the truth and you don't need it validated anymore. Then you can go on to creating something else. Um, but thought has to become, uh, mind has to become matter. Thought has to become reality. 
I, your identity, seeks am, the experience. So that's why people stay in those loops because they haven't changed the core identity yet. And um, when they're ready, they'll do that. But again, that that's a four letter word. Sometimes change, you know, like, a, like a bad word, like, you know, like, Oh, change. I don't know. That feels like a four letter word to me. Um, but in a lot of people, and I know we both know people in our lives that <laughs> their, their tolerance for suffering is unbelievable. Mm-hmm like they'll continue to suffer versus change. They'll continue to ignore truth versus change. And it's just, it's incredible how much people can delude themselves. So, um, And why do you think we resist change so much? It's the unknown. We like to live in the known. The ego likes what's known. I know if I drink this bottle of whiskey that I can avoid all those terrible, horrible thoughts in my head about myself for at least a night. I can forget it. I can loosen up. I can let down my inhibitions and my insecurities. And that coats my mind with a temporary delusion. But then they wake up the next day feeling worse, not only about what they did, their actions, how their body feels, and then they're left with the same thoughts again. So what do they got to do come five o'clock? They got to dilute themselves again to the pain and the suffering until that has eroded so much in their life that they're finally like, okay, I got to change this for good. And that's when they start to get into some programs or some help that can change that. But really spiritual awareness is the best way, in my opinion, to overcome it. And what I mean by spiritual is, I mean, spirituality to me is, consciousness is awareness that's what spirituality is to me and expanding consciousness so anyways to answer your question tyranny i think that people are just in general fearful of change any kind of change and those that thrive in life those that succeed those that do well those that have the best relationships or the you know they're not afraid of change they have flow and they adapt this is going to get me on a little bit of a, a rant here but it's like water right? The cleanest and purest water flows. Why does it flow? Because when it hits a bank, it doesn't stop. It turns and it finds a way to keep itself in motion and creative motion. So it keeps going and flowing, but water that stops running becomes stagnant and disease riddled and algae filled. So that's the analogy of, of a mind that doesn't want to adapt, change, evolve, advance. There's, there's a certain stagnation. You can look at people that age gracefully and people that get really cranky and crotchety and just, you know, angrier as they get older. Uh, they, they can't stand change. And I remember in my generation, you know, when it was this and like, you know, they get angry at the world. It's not the world's fault. It's just the nature of change and adaptation and evolution. They get mad at technology. And I know it can be scary as you get older. So don't get me wrong. I understand a part of that is uh, my parents are aging and et cetera. That it, you know, but I think to age gracefully is to flow and adapt with it and stay young of heart as much as you can, as much as you can. So, so it's really about learning to live with ease with all the constant changes that occur in our life or kind of flow with the changes that occur in, in our life and not resisting. Yeah. I, I think, saying. yeah. Don't resist the overwhelming truth of change. I'm not saying you have to agree with every change that takes place. You know, I mean, there's some things that worked for the older generation that they just don't see working today, but it wouldn't be happening if it wasn't working in some respect. And so, um, so I guess the more you can open your mind to that, you know, the, the, the better off you'll be. Um, you know, we, we could take uh, an example of that, be like things that were funny in humor that made fun of different people or races back in the 70s or 80s. It's not funny anymore today. 
It doesn't work. Mm -hmm. And there's a reason for that. It's not because of political correctness. People jump to that. It's like, oh, everybody's so political correct. It's not because of that. There's underlying reasons to that. There's been suffering and a lot of problems that have come out of uh, whether they're racial remarks or whether they're um, um, whether you're talking about people that have disabilities or whatever it is that we use different words for in the past, there's been a lot of suffering that's come or LGBTQ, you know, people have died and committed suicide and, and, and there's been tough things that have happened. And so as a society, we learn to adapt and evolve and understand how to have more compassion and change the way we do things. It's not because, you know, people jump to political correctness and everybody has to be perfect. It's not the case. There's something deeper that's going on there that, that people are looking to help move forward. And I'm not saying everything is perfect and correct, but the major movements have real meaning in it as it relates to our advancement mm -hmm. as a society, as a culture, and as humanity. Mm -hmm. That's why they're happening. That's it's exactly right. That's exactly why they happen. Mm -hmm. But... Um, when people are used to a certain way or you have like older generation that's used to a certain way of talking and doing things, you know, I think they're more scared of slipping up than they are angry at the change. And so they, they can sometimes blame oh, everybody. So you have to be, you know, or, or look at the self-help movement or, or not the self-help movement. I raised two children, my wife and I, they're 21 and 24 now. So I went through all the positive you know, everybody gets a trophy thing, you know, where so many people got upset about that in this country. Oh, now we have a generation that's soft because everybody, well, the reason that the needle swung to that side was because there was so much psychological damage from all the negativity on the other side that we tried to move to a space where we could help people have more fun or feel better about themselves. Did the needle swing too far? Maybe, but it wasn't for out of a, a malintent. There wasn't a, a bad um, um, intent in doing that for people. There was the mm -hmm. intent to help ease suffering mm -hmm. and not make people feel bad. And I think everything, yeah, I think everything's working to come back into balance in a sense, everything in nature. Yep. Always. So it's kind of like, when you're saying, why did it swing that far that way? Well, because it was kind of nature's way of trying to come back into balance. And yeah. that was the result of it where we were. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. That's exactly right. And, and so sometimes the needle swings one way a little bit too far and then goes back the other, you know, goes back the other way. But, um, you know, and some people take it to extremes one way or the other, you know, mm -hmm. we, we've never, um, we never did that. You know, my, my kids learn sometimes you win sometimes, you know, sometimes you don't win. And you, if you want to want to like in sports, you want to win, you got to fight for it, you know, good for you for the effort. There's nothing wrong with congratulating them for the effort. And, and, and Hey, you went out there, you competed, you did a good job. I'm talking when they're 10, 11, 12 years old. It's about fun anyways at that age. But, um, but the ones that are serious about it learn very quickly what it takes to, to really succeed and the work and the effort. So anyways, I think a lot of people can, can take things to, to extremes when it comes to change, but all change mm -hmm. has a reason behind it. Mm -hmm. There's a reason behind movements. Really good yeah. Really, really good perspective that I hadn't heard before. Um, and I think with your kids too, like, I mean, I can't imagine raising kids and all the like, cause there's so much dialogue of like what you should do, what you shouldn't do. It's hard to like, you know, make choices. Like, I feel like it, it almost like paralyzes you of like, oh my God, I don't know what to do. So I'm not going to do anything at all. So it's like, it's kind of trial and error of like seeing what works and what doesn't work. And it's like, that's what we're doing collectively every day of our lives. <laughs> So it's like exactly. uh, your, your kids yeah. probably have such a like a opportunity to teach you. Yeah, in and and in a lot of ways, both of them have taught us, which is interesting because kids don't have a filter. They're very, they they they're very altruistic, and they see the world through a, a an unbiased lens. 
and we've done the best we can to let that not be filtered by us. Um, we've guided them a little bit here or there. Um, and I think we've set an example. I think that's the most important thing. It's not your words as much as the example of who you are that your kids are really paying attention to. Um, as we're on this sort of tangent of parenting. Um, but um, yeah, because, and but, but there was no preaching. Like I, you know, I never went at them with this work and told them that they've got to learn this work and do this work. Um, at the right time, they've asked me questions about it and they've read the material. Um, but I let them come to that on, the, on their own because I've trusted them and instilled with them that they have our trust and faith. And when they got off line a little bit here or there, we nudged them back a little bit. But we trusted their ability based on them seeing how we were are as people. That makes sense. And I think that ties in. Yeah, I know. I think it ties in too with just the way that we're expressing ourselves every day too. And thinking about the future generations that they're ultimately learning from us by how we're showing up every day, not necessarily what we're preaching, but like how we're living our own lives. They're taking notice of that and they're, they're taking it in and then they're replicating it. That's exactly right. So it's like, it's exactly right. Yeah. yeah. It's a really powerful type of responsibility. <laughs> yep. Exactly. Yeah, it is. But it's, but I think, you know, a lot of parents parent out of fear. And I think that puts fear in the, into, and insecurity into the kids. And I've seen right. it happen many times. And, and it's because they don't want their kids to make the same mistakes they made. They don't even give them the faith to see that they're going to be different people. They immediately, come over the top at them, like, don't do this and don't do that. And they put this fear in them and then it self fulfills. Mm -hmm. So that's not the way we did it. We let them go out, make their choices. And then we adjusted and guided accordingly. Um, you know, and, and again, everybody has a different situation and everybody's psychological makeup is the children, you know, there's different souls that come in. So it's, it's a different challenge for each parent. I'm not saying, um, you know, people don't have their challenges with their kids, no matter how great they've raised them, because they do. Um, mm -hmm. But, um, but anyways, that's just the way that, um, that we did it. Mm -hmm. um, it's a good topic, too, because and I don't know why I, like I no, want to dig deeper into this, okay. but maybe there's okay. a reason in it. But um, yeah. I mean, as a father, too, it's like, you have that instinct to like, protect your kids from pain. So it's like, do you feel like you kind of had to let go of that, like strive and desire to protect your kids from pain and kind of allow them to have their own experiences? Because I feel like that's something that we all want to do with the people that we love. It's well, like, you know, when my son wanted to, you know, get on a skateboard, I said, no problem, but just make sure you put a helmet on in case you, you know, flip and crack your head. Like, that's the pain I want to protect him from with just, you know, having a helmet on since it's something we can do, Survival. right? That, yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. easy. Um, but when it came to going to school or having to deal with social issues with kids when they were eight and nine and 10 and 11 and 12, you know, unfortunately, that's something they have to find their way through themselves. And then when they needed advice or things were going sideways or, or they felt left out with their friends, then we were able to come in with the teaching, hey, here's a great way to do this. Here's a great way to handle this. Think about maybe doing it this way. Um, but two things we always taught our kids. One, to always believe anything is possible for you. And two, know that if you're a good person, you treat other people well, and you're a good human being, you are worth anything that you want to accomplish. Anything. There should be no restriction on what you feel yourself worthy of creating if you're willing to work hard for it. Um, that's it. Just be good to other people. Express your heart. Um, and, uh, and, and think in unlimited possibilities about what you can do in this world. Those are the two main things. And then everything else we had to let them go through. And, and, and they're both two different kids, completely different. My daughter and my son really? are completely, oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I won't go into That's detail so about what's different. <laughs> yeah. But they are. Yeah. So there's different ways that, that we, you know, two completely distinct relationships just because of who they are. 
Um, just goes to show you could be yeah. raised in the same environment and like just from how you perceive the world and your own beliefs, you can learn to be completely different than, you know. Well, I don't think it's home. learning. I don't think it's learning to be completely different. I think that's the makeup of their genetics and what their souls are. I just think they're just two different souls, just at two different levels of awareness. Mm. You know, one is more self-focused. One is more other people focused, mm. you know, just at where they're at different characteristics they got from me and my wife or, and, and all the generations before us that have formed who they are. Mm what they came in with. And then that has caused how they've experienced things along the way, right? That has formed how their mind has perceived the information that's come into their brain. It's based on mm -hmm. who they were at the starting point. And everybody's at a different starting point when they enter, they get a different mix of genetics at conception. I believe that that moment that they get those genetics at conception comes from uh, where the parents were in their consciousness at, at that time, not where they are at birth or where they are when they're five, but where their parents were at conception. I believe that too. Which I think is interesting. Mm -hmm. And then that's their starting point. Uh-huh. And you're kind of almost taking on all your ancestral, I don't want to say trauma, but I guess you could say all your ancestral beliefs and stories and all of that like you carry that with you so it really can take just one person in the family to break free from you know a limiting belief or exactly and it changes for the lineage down the line it changes the genetic right. code going down the line because they overcame that then they conceived and at the time of conception they had overcome that so the gene was switched in a different way and that got passed. Now the altered evolved gene got passed to that next generation. And that I believe is the nature of evolution change. But yeah, but let's say there's a hundred different traits, just, just to make it simple, a hundred different traits in one area of life. Let's say it's in relationships. One child could get five pieces of those traits. One child could get 50 pieces of those traits, and it could be more predominant in that second child and insignificant in the first child because they just didn't get that particular socialization or trauma experience or mm -hmm. predominance to that type of situation. Um, like for example, my, I, for some reason, my body revolts being close to heights. It just doesn't like any ledges, really? doesn't like anything. Yeah. Can't get near any of that. Right. You know, I thought you um, were fearless with that kind of stuff. Well, Who uh, known? of intellectually but my body does something <laughs> when i get near a ledge and you know my son he could press himself up against the glass in a tall building doesn't even bother him or affect him no mm -hmm. fear whatsoever can go on any ride my daughter can go on any ride remember once we were at the top of the stratosphere and there's a ride where this thing literally drops you over the edge and her and my wife i'm like no way <laughs> i'm not going anywhere <laughs> near that but anyway, so but it's just interesting how we each get different genetics. And yeah. it's interesting that we're talking about that because that's coming up in, in a section of the book. We're actually way ahead um, in a lot of ways in this discussion <laughs> right now. But um, anyway, so um, were there any other questions on that area? Because I don't want to close it off. With, pa with parenting? No, yeah. I, I, I don't know. I just felt the need to dive a little deeper <laughs> into it because ultimately, I mean, what you say to your kids is like the dialogue we should be having with ourselves. I believe like we should be talking to ourselves like a child yeah. in a way. So I think there's value in kind of hearing about how oh, you parent absolutely. and yeah. And, no, yeah, and that's and why you're co-hosting with me. Cause that's what I want is exactly <laughs> what I was hoping you would do is dig in in areas and bring stuff out that I normally might not talk about or express. And I think mm -hmm. that it's really cool that you're able to do that. Um, mm -hmm. So going back to where we were in chapter one, we were talking about how everything has a will and an expression. And the next part that I talked about um, just talked about the idea that as we've gone through, as humanity has gotten uh, more advanced, our identity is not formed by hunting for food and creating shelter. 
like it was mm -hmm. 200 years ago. Now we're defined by the expression of who we are, our identity, maybe our job, or maybe our relationship, or maybe what we look like on social media. There's so many different ways now that we're defined that um, it's become more of a psychological identification with our identity as it relates mm -hmm. to our peace of mind. And would and you so, say a feeling alive too? Yeah, feeling alive, like we need to express ourselves in a certain way to feel alive. But like I said before, uh, it was basically uh, shelter, bearing children, raising children, and, you know, providing food. Um, I mean, in the most basic primal needs. Now, right. it's much more complicated than that as it relates to our identity. And I think that's created a lot of anxiety and a lot of the suffering mm -hmm. that so many people are going through in today's world. Um and, you know, well, I, I don't have a, a negative opinion of social media. I have a neutral opinion. I think it's been fantastic in so many ways, but I also think it's been taken and, and it's been negative for a lot of people in a lot of ways. It just depends on the intent and what you're doing with it. But um, in the book, I have a line that says the priority of our social acceptance can be summed up in the following progression of thought. If I'm accepted, I'm loved. If I'm loved, I matter. If I matter, I exist. Mm. The need for social acceptance is demonstrated every day by cultural attitudes, moral behavior, the accumulation of material possessions, and religious beliefs. This need is so strong that the more a person longs to feel connected to or accepted by others, the more willing that person will be to give up the powerful capacity of independent will or thought and submit to group behavior and thought. Now, this is really interesting because group identity is playing a big role in today's society on one side, like of the political spectrum or another, it's become a huge thing of identity and people have been empowered by being connected to a large group where they felt small before they were connected to the group. And then they felt connected to so many others with similar thought. But I think the most important piece of this paragraph is this idea that the true, one of the true keys of life is to always keep your own independent thought because you have a divining rod of truth within you. It's in your gut. It's in your heart. You know what's right or wrong. If you'll allow all those other needs to fade away, you can tap into what's true and what's right. Now, when I see let all, the, all those other needs fade away, that's not a light statement. That can be a big statement for a lot of people to do that. But the point is, is that we have the ability to know and discern truth. And so the more people want to be attached to a certain religious group, the more they're just going to look at what the religion says, not deviate, take it very literally, and, you know, be very uh, protective and pack mentality about it. Mm -hmm. Same thing with a political organization. Same thing with a, um, uh, any other organization people belong to. Um, could be uh, any other cause, could be uh, an environmental cause. It could be a, a police force. It could, you know what I'm saying? So the key is to, to be able to be part of that group, but still keep your independent thought, I think is the real trick, right? Yeah. Yeah. And um, it's almost like you have to view it all as like these different tribes. And it's like, no matter what tribe you're in, you're learning to discover first, the notion that we're all connected on such a deep level but you're also trying to integrate that idea of your individuality like understanding the realization that we're all one but that you still have your individual thought and expression and it's yes. such a challenge and i think we it, first discover it in our family and then it branches off into these different collective groups right and so and that's I, where like there's spiritual assignments in a way wouldn't you say yeah. That, would you say spiritual assignments? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a cool word. Yeah, exactly. I think going through that's almost like trying, you have to try and you have to figure it out. Um, but I don't think there's anything to with being associated with any organization or any group. As long as mm -hmm. you don't let the need for group acceptance mm -hmm. exceed your belief in yourself and what you believe to be true. Mm -hmm. And too many people fall into the group mentality 
and they lose their way completely and they lose truth and they lose they, everything. And, and really they, they stop evolving because they just listen to what the group leader is saying is true or the, whoever's running the group, the, the organization of the group is saying is true. And they give up their own independent view and thought on where truth lies. And any great philosopher or teacher or creator throughout history has always been able to step into their own mind on what they know is true outside of the group think, or at least question, be able to question. One of the, uh, I can only speak for myself, but in, in class, my hand was up all the time. I was constantly challenging teachers on, on really? what they said. Yeah. Just, just out of curiosity. If, if I, if I felt something was off, like, why is that? Or why do we have to think like that? Or why, you know, I, that's good. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I questioned my own religion. You know, I, <laughs> I mean, I'll share the story. I was, I was being bar mitzvah and I remember thinking, wow, I spent four years reading, writing, and speaking this. And I sang it beautifully at my bar mitzvah, what I was supposed to read from the Torah, my portion of my dedication. And I remember thinking as I was doing it, this is crazy. I've learned how to read, write, and speak this fluently, but I have no idea what the spiritual implication is of what I'm saying, which was great because it set me on this spiritual quest to figure out a greater sense of meaning about life right. and idea, but I had to go outside the religious t teaching mm -hmm. in order to get a greater truth. It's mm -hmm. so ironic, actually. It's, it's so ironic. Do you, do you feel that now you can return back to your religion and participate in it, but not be so confined within it? Like, Wow, because, what a great question and way of saying it. So, so that's Daniel? fascinating. So, no, I, I think that's a fascinating question because the answer to that is, is, is in a lot of ways, yes, because look, my heritage, culture, family, food, holidays, uh, sacraments, you know, they all make sense to me now in a way that I've never seen before. Uh -oh, I'm losing you a little bit. Oh, I just was saying like the sacraments, the culture, the food, the holidays, I understand them at a level that I, I never understood as a kid with this new awareness, but I had to go outside to gain the awareness to come back to mm -hmm. understand that. Now, do I appreciate and respect? Yes. I respect my ancestry and what they went through and the culture and the beauty of the religion, just like I do all the other religions out there. Um, and I see the beauty in all of them, but um, right. but, but from a, from a, and there isn't a lot of dogma in our, in, in, in Judaism, there, there isn't very, it's very light on dogma. Um, but I, I, I've defined mm -hmm. myself from a religious perspective, but I would say my religion is love. It just simplifies it. That doesn't mean I can't appreciate, you know, and have holiday and, and, and enjoy and respect the culture. But, um, but from a, and, and some of the religious teachings, but I, but I enjoy them from all philosophies and religions. So I, mm -hmm. you know, there's no, so yeah, I can right. come back to it, but not in any devoted way, mm -hmm. if that makes sense I, without any yeah, disrespect. No, yeah. Mm -hmm. Cause I think when you're like, I, I think I use the word confined to one religion, there's like fear around exploring others it's like oh no 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 but once you kind of step out into spirituality and then you revisit it's like you can almost find a sense of peace and resonate with with each kind of religion without being so attached to it and labeled by it in a way I, I want to wrap this on this but because this is an interesting point is that some people, their identity is formed in their religion, and that's okay. Their religion is their identity. That's what they believe, and that's okay for them. But again, mm -hmm. for those who are true seekers of expanding their minds and empowering themselves on a much bigger scale or, or a different scale, then you may have to challenge certain things within the group think in order to do that. And mm -hmm. I think, I mean, I, look, I... I Every religious teacher, the fun, mm -hmm. the, the founding teacher was a seeker. Every single one. 
Moses, Christ, Buddha, I, they were all seekers of a greater truth. Mm -hmm. And then once they brought those teachings down, a religion was formed around them. So again, it's up to each individual, but, and I'm not, I'm not mm -hmm. telling anyone to renounce their religion. That's part of their life. And that's part of yeah, their identity. So it's just and their them history. interpreting truth in a different way. Being willing to step outside the teachings to ask questions, always be willing to ask questions. I think that's the key to life, one of the keys to life, whatever you're trying to create. Mm -hmm. Don't be afraid of asking questions because again, the world is always changing and evolving and expanding. So there's always new questions. Like I'll never say I know everything. Matter mm -hmm. of fact, one of the keys to all this wisdom was saying, I know nothing. And when I said, I know nothing, it created mm -hmm. a vacuum and a void that just dragged all the the wisdom towards me so i think humility that's why i've said many times humility is the key to wisdom when you say you know and that's what again tyranny that's what's so great about you is that you're a seeker you're a questioner you're open and that's why all this wisdom's pouring into you. not just tonight but all the stuff that you've been doing the last year or two you know and all the books you've you know it's pouring in which is great so thank you for doing this with me tonight absolutely I enjoyed every um, bit of it. <laughs> it was incredibly, we went way deep. We could probably go for hours and talk about this stuff. Um, and we all, <laughs> the funny thing is we only got through half of chapter one <laughs> as we've talked about all this. Oh my but God. <laughs> I know it's crazy, but some good stuff in here. We're going to keep these discussions every other podcast. I'll probably do a talk about I am and some of the material. Tierney's going to be on with me as we do some interviews with some other people. Um, which will be coming up in future podcasts. Um, but again, I thank everybody for listening tonight to this discussion uh, on self-awareness and self-understanding. And we're going to keep going deeper and deeper into this. So I'm glad you've uh, been along for the ride and hopefully um, you'll be on it for future podcasts. Um, and again, thank you again, Tierney, for, for co-hosting with me tonight. We'll pick up where we left off the next time we do a podcast on the book. Um, I think for my next one, I've got an interview coming up uh, with uh, someone who overcame a tragedy in their life, and they're going to talk about how they did it and how they've learned to thrive through the tragedy. So that'll be um, a good podcast topic for next time. Um, I wish everybody a happy new year. Thanks for joining us on the podcast tonight. Tierney, thanks again. And um, thanks. we'll, yeah, absolutely. And we'll uh, see you next time on The Guru. So long.